On this episode, we talk about TLC, NXT TakeOver, Raw, Brock Lesnar's return, and a new Heyman guy? Now, unbite that. Hello everybody and welcome to episode 69 of Bite That, the semi-somewhat maybe international professional wrestling podcast where we talk about the ups and downs of that which we love, which is the world of professional wrestling right here live in the bedroom studio, guys. <laughs> uh, for, for those that are listening on audio, this is a very special edition of of the podcast because we are live from my bedroom. We got <laughs> Mr. Ryan McNulty all the way from Boston, Massachusetts. Right now, I, I can I can touch him. Okay, Ryan, we're doing this right now on uh, video, t- video exclusive. YouTube.com uh, slash Cody that. Rhodes, uh, anyway, Stardust and Goldust. Style. Oh, so here we go. Oh my God. <laughs> oh wow, it's a powerful thing, guys. My name is Juan Villas. I am from San Juan, Puerto Rico, and also joining us a very good friend of ours all the way from Brooklyn, Brooklyn. No. We got <laughs> Jamie Burko. How you doing, man? I'm doing good, man. How are you? I'm doing very good, man. It's uh, going to be a very special episode. We got to talk about a lot of things, including TLC. So getting right down to it, I want to get your overall reactions on what happened at TLC. We have a, uh, a conclusive match that we didn't think was going to be the main event that we're going to be getting to. Obviously, we got to talk about Raw, Brock Lesnar returning. But first... Getting to Dolph Ziggler, because obviously we know that Dolph, uh, for quite a long time, WD wasn't doing too much with him, but now we see that he dominated Survivor Series. He did all this stuff, and now we have a brand new Intercontinental Champion once okay. again after a pretty good ladder match. So, Ryan, taking it to you first, what was your overall reaction, and then some feedback regarding Ziggler becoming the champion once again? Overall, TLC, I thought, was kind of middle of the road pay-per-view it didn't really blow me away and kind of just jumping right into the ladder match uh kind of how i thought it was going to be pretty much the match of the night um i really liked this match i felt like it was really uh brutal and uh even at some points was really hard to watch but uh you know it was the one i was most into and it's kind of sad that the rest of the show was kind of it wasn't completely downhill from there but Uh, definitely this was the match of the night and there wasn't really anything else that topped it for me. Um, I just really liked the intensity of it, the, you know, the brutality, uh, Harper, especially when he did that dive to the outside with the ladder. Um, it just felt like these guys were really killing themselves and, uh, it was a really entertaining match and I, and I was happy to see, you know, hometown hero, Dolph Ziggler, you know, coming away with the victory. Uh, even if it might have been just a little too short of a reign for Harper, I still really enjoyed the match and uh, was happy with the results regardless. Yes, Sam, I was really happy with how it turned out. I'm taking it to you, Jamie. Were you surprised this match basically kicked off the show? And then the fact that Luke Harper, who just won the IC Championship just a couple, like, what was it, like a month ago? Yeah, one month. Yeah, so what do you think about that? Um, I hope that they stop hot potatoing the Intercontinental title. Because uh, I'm not a big fan of the whole hot potato thing where... Because I feel like we just had that with Ziggler and Miz. And now I hope they don't start doing that with uh, Ziggler and Harper. So I hope that if they rematch them, that Harper's not just going to win it back. And then we're back where we started. Yeah, so like uh, my reaction is that I think it's awesome what they're doing with Ziggler and the way that we have a clear idea of what... Uh, they want to do something with him. Obviously, we can't get too excited because we've seen this before. He's become champion, world champion, and then concussion. All this comes down. So he almost seems, am I getting a Shawn Michaels vibe? It seems like he's that underdog guy that gets pummeled throughout the matches, but keeps coming back. And just the overall fan feedback, uh, taking it to you, Ryan, do you think that they're trying to build him as as pretty boy, athletic, sort of oversell-y? There are a lot of similarities because we talk about similarities with Mr. Perfect. But I think we could do that with HBK, too. No, absolutely. Uh, even down to, you know, using the super kick to, to win that match. That was pretty cool. Um, I do get that vibe, you know, from him. But the way they're building him, it does seem like the machine is finally behind him. But it's like, I don't want to get my hopes up because I feel like they've started and stopped many Ziggler pushes. But, you know, Intercontinental Champion, even if they are hot, potato- hot mm-hmm. potatoing it, I think it is 
pretty important because it's really like the top TV champion because we yeah. don't we don't see that world title on TV that often. <laughs> so I do feel like it is more important now uh, than it maybe it has been in a couple of years. And uh, and to agree with Jamie, it's like at this point. You know, I talked about how it's good to trade titles, but I think at this point we need a steady champion, and Ziggler's exactly. uh, the perfect guy to, to do that. It's funny, a Reddit post I think I brought up last week too is like, Seth Rollins in a, is on, in a way is the champion of the company because he's the top heel with there being no top heel as champion right now that's always there. Even though we got Brock Lesnar now, it really leaves Dolph Ziggler as being that main champion. Now, talking about Cena and Rollins. We thought this match was going to close out the show. I thought it was going to close out the show because of the stipulation. If Cena won, he retains his number one contendership. But if Seth Rollins uh, wins, Cena is no longer the number one contender. They didn't confirm whether it was going to be Rollins, whatever the case. But then, lo and behold, we see the match is like, like in the middle of the card, really. Uh, Jamie, did, did that surprise you? And uh, why did you think WWE did that? Um, I actually thought that uh, Ambrose and Wyatt would actually close out the show, to be honest, because of the TLC stipulation okay. being more important than just a regular tables match in the end of the day. If you really want TLC to still be important, you have that close out the show. So when I actually heard that uh, Wyatt and Ambrose was a TLC, I figured that that would actually be the main event regardless of what else was there. Now, for Cena and Rollins, um, I'm not happy with the overbooked way that that match went especially when big show got involved because it's like where was he during the whole match if it's no dq i'd just have big show come out with me and start wrecking hell for the whole match because reasons (laughs) yeah But, but to actually get into the whole uh you know the fact that Cena and Rollins was in the middle of the car, that did surprise me because it might have been a year or two ago, uh, Rollins, not Rollins, uh, Ziggler and Cena closed out the show, and I think it was a ladder match. It was just a regular ladder match, even though they did involve tables and chairs, and it didn't end up mattering anyway. Um, So I did fully expect, you know, with the stipulation involved in the tables match, that it was going to close out this show, and I was kind of pleasantly surprised that they gave it to, uh, you know, to Bray Wyatt and uh, Dean Ambrose, you know, once again, kind of like what they did with Hell in a Cell, giving, you know, the younger guys a shot to close out the show. So I thought that was really cool. Um, the tables match itself, though, uh, Juan, what did you think of it? I want to, I'm going to, I'm going to be the kind of the host here for a second and pass it to you. I've done enough whoa, talking. Whoa, whoa. Uh, <laughs> it was really hard because I was trying to get motivated with getting a conclusive finish. It was like, you know what? Let let Rollins just win the match or let just Cena win the match. Whatever the case, just have like a cleaner thing. But of course, they had to do with the whole J&J security thing again. And uh, <clears throat> my apologies, people. When you involve Big Show, then you have returning Roman Reigns and you have the people, you know, popping But it's like the most bittersweet thing because Reigns gets involved. Then they use that crowd cheering as a way to mask the fact that Cena won the match. And I'm just thinking like, dude, what? That is, you're playing with my emotions, man. (laughs) I felt like I was being played with. It it, it was really painful for me. It was very reminiscent to me of that cage match that Cena and Bray Wyatt had, I think, back at Extreme Rules. Where it was like... It was basically three on one the entire time. And then uh, in this case, there was even more interference than that. And then Cena just ends up winning anyway, despite, you know, all the odds going against him. Um, And uh, I pretty much called it last week during our predictions where we all felt like it was the perfect opportunity for Rollins to win there. And I thought, you know, it makes way too much sense. Cena's going to win. And sure enough. That's exactly what happened. Cena wins in the end of the day, like always. Yeah, and uh, we actually have a Twitter question regarding something that happened on Raw, but because we are talking about this Rollins-Cena match, we saw how uh, Raw concluded. So, Ryan, could you bring that up for a quick second? Uh, Yes, so uh, from the Twitter account at Rollins Nation, and excuse me while I read from this sheet here, he says, uh, thoughts on Rollins aligning himself with uh, Heyman, but... Not being a Paul Heyman guy, should he go on his own, uh, no security, etc.? Yeah, obviously this has to do with the raw conclusion where uh, we're going to get to that pretty soon. 
Brock Lesnar comes back, then we expect Brock Lesnar to decimate, to conquer everybody. Of course, uh, we see that Seth Rollins and Paul Heyman form some sort of alliance. So obviously, people are thinking he's aligned with them, but he's not a Paul Heyman guy because that didn't happen, and I don't think he ever should be. I think Seth Rollins is pretty much a made man right now. Do I think he should have done that? Yeah, because Brock Lesnar is not always there. So this is a good way of them involving Paul Heyman with another guy because how is he going to interact? How much can you be the advocate of a guy when that guy's not always there? So you get him active. You get him active with Seth Rollins. You get more heat on Seth Rollins. People hate him. People hate Heyman. You know, hopefully nobody hates us. It's a good time. I think there's... This could just be simply a one-week handshake and nothing really ever comes of it. That wouldn't surprise me at all. They also have a lot to play off here with the fact that Rollins is the money in the bank holder. Uh, and that, you know, maybe down the line that turns into some sort of... Uh, yeah, or it turns into some sort of feud between them or... Yeah, exactly. You could see Heyman trying to, uh, you know, sway Rollins from wanting to cash in and things like that. So there's a lot they can do with it. But again, it wouldn't surprise me if it's just like, that's it. That's all we ever see of it. He helped him out one time. Maybe uh, Rollins has to like repay him at Rumble by interfering or something like that. Uh, and that's all we see of it. I got to bring this match up. We shook our head a little bit last week in the, predic- in the predictions game. Stairs match. <laughs> How, what else do I say about this other than a stairs match happened at TLC featuring stairs? We had Big Show taking on Eric Rowan. Now, part one, what was your reaction uh, to the match itself? Do, do you think they did the absolute most that they could with that match? Considering the two guys involved, I actually think it wasn't that bad at all. Um, I was completely fine with the match. I wasn't expecting a five-star match with uh, tons of acrobatic moves and all of that. You know, I was just basically expecting a slugfest with people throwing stairs around and getting knocked into stairs. And that's pretty much what we got. And I think uh, I think Rowan actually ended up coming away looking not too bad, uh, despite the fact that he lost. And uh, for what it was, it was all right. And he lost on Raw, mind you. Yeah, that, that's something we unfortunately got to get to. First, Jamie, what do you think of the, na- the nickname Big Red? Well, they're slowly stripping Kane away of every little thing that he possibly has Poor when kid, they call man. him Big Red. I am a big Kane fan, so. Yes. Big uh, Red. I'm not a fan of Big Red. Just, no. It's, it's not a good nickname to me. Now, what do you think about this whole conclusion where Big Show pretty much dominated Eric Rowan? We saw in Raw sort of why. Apparently, we're going to be getting uh, a little bit of... Uh, Roman Reigns versus Big Show going on, but you know we've been sort of building up Eric Rowan in the podcast as you know what David e is apparently going to do something with the guy. They're doing something. Oh, okay, he nope. loses two matches in in really bad fashion. He looks really bad at the end. So, uh, Jamie, do you think this is it for Eric Rowan, or are they just using the guy to build up Roman? Um, for Eric Rowan, I believe the future does not look too bright for him. I mean, he got knocked out two nights in a row. A just doesn't appear he's going to be a strong factor in the end of the day ryan are we we apologize to eric ruin in this podcast does that apology (laughs) still apply i think it does i'm I'm not ready to think it's just completely over for him i was okay with the loss at tlc but then the next night on raw he really just didn't come away looking too strong either it seems like now that reigns is back that uh you know, Rowan's just kind of getting pushed out of the spotlight. Yeah, unfortunately. And uh, one thing that I got to bring up, it really annoyed the crap out of me. We get it. The stairs are big. Because during that entire match, Michael Cole kept saying, look look at the size of those stairs, man. And I'm like, I-, I get it. They've been there all these years. Yeah, they are as How big. How many times do we need an anatomy of the stairs, by the way? I know, right? It's They're treating us like five-year-olds. And I get that they have that audience that is literally five years old. But man, I mean, we are three guys. I'm getting married this Friday. We got a couple of people here, you know, that they're not, you know, five years old. Stop treating us like that. You know, it turns me away from the product. Uh, did that hurt you during the show? I sort of felt like the commentary was horrible. 
some of the worst WWE commentary I've ever heard. I wanted to mute. I legitimately sometimes just lowered the volume and kept watching the pay-per-view while, you know, like listening to some music or something because I, it was taking away the enjoyment I had from that match. That and, of course, Michael Cole, you know, falling from nothing. <laughs> yes, Michael Cole basically taking the worst bump of the year, and it was, uh, it was just hilarious. Obviously, Rollins was probably supposed to... Uh, maybe hit him more but it was basically like Rollins just kind of tapped the chair and then Cole just fell out of it and and when I initially saw it I, I saw it and I was like maybe I missed something maybe it wasn't as bad as I thought and then after kind of going back it was and, worse yeah looking at one of the the gifs or gifs whatever you want to call it it was uh it was a lot worse yeah yeah unfortunately and uh we gotta get to the main event because I didn't think it was going to be the main event. You guys did, so good on you. High five. High five. Man. High five over here, man. We got two high fives on video. YouTube.com slash bite that cast. <laughs> Go watch that. We got Dean Ambrose taking on Bray Wyatt. I think that this was the match I was looking forward to the most. I love their previous match. I agreed with the ending of the previous match because I think this is a feud they can keep going for a very long time. So I was really pumped. I was really pumped for this match. And of course... Completely removing the conclusion that uh, I think I'm afraid of unplugging my TV. We have a this is a 55 inch TV in the background. If this if I unplug this right now, according to the WWE, we're all gonna go blind. Magic powers. Magic powers. Magic powers aside, what did you think of this match, Ryan? I thought it was pretty good. I kind of felt worn out by the time we got to this part of the pay per view, um, and and I wasn't into it as much as I'd like to be. That being said, I felt like Bray Wyatt just got the holy hell beaten out of him and didn't really do that much. It didn't really feel as back and forth. It just felt like Bray Wyatt was just getting the crap kicked out of him. Then some fluky thing happened and then Wyatt won. Um, I also, I don't know how I feel about um, Ambrose just kind of doing the same table spot three times. Yeah, you know, may, like I can see how he's a maniac and he wants to keep punishing Wyatt, but I feel like you're putting your body on the line way more than you need to, and I don't think you're just gonna get the reaction you want doing that same spot three times. So I feel like he just beat the hell out of himself for nothing. Taking it to you, Jamie. Do you agree? Do you think it felt a little bit unnecessary? Um, I personally did not see that match at the time. So I don't really wish to give that much of a comment for a match I didn't really see. But I do want to say something about Bray Wyatt. Uh, from reading, apparently they might do Bray Wyatt versus The Undertaker at WrestleMania. Whoa. So Bray Wyatt against The Undertaker, and here he is winning against Ambrose with his little magic trick. Maybe that's like a sign that for The Undertaker deal. Anything's possible, man, because that TV thing legitimately gave me a headache. Like, I, I got a little but bit pissed off. Is that really the Bray Wyatt, though? Can Bray Wyatt only make magic appear if a cord is removed from a television? <laughs> Wouldn't it be something a little more supernatural, like what happened at Hell in a Cell, where he comes through the ring with the smoking lantern or whatever? I think it was just meant to be like it's some technical error <laughs> or something like that. Ryan, at, at one point in WWE history, a very old woman gave birth to a hand. We saw that hand grow up. So I think the the thing I want to point out is expect anything from the WWE. I don't think it really is a, a, like a magic trick they, the, they tried to do with the TV thing. I just think it was ridiculous. And I don't necessarily agree with it. But it was a good match. Uh, I felt that I was really happy it was the, the last match. But I don't know. It, it feels like there needs to be a little bit something more here. Uh... I do agree that Bray Wyatt should have been beaten down as he was. Why? Because his character, the idea is that you can kick him down. He's still going to try to deliver that message. Dean Ambrose's character, however, is like, I'm going to beat people down and I don't care who it is. So that actually works. You don't need to win. You don't need to get the most offense in a match to win it. But I don't know. It, it, it needs a little bit more uh, juice in there. And uh, I actually want to bring up another question that we got here. Uh, so, Ryan, could you take that away about Dean Ambrose and Bray Wyatt? Yes, this uh, comes from the Twitter handle at Fight Best Fight. And he says, do you think it's weird WWE didn't mention the Bray and Dean TLC match on Raw? I actually thought that was very interesting because, number one, they weren't even on Raw. 
they have a super SmackDown special this week. It's WWE week on the USA Network. We're recording on a Tuesday, so odds are stuff is happening right now that, uh, you know, maybe they're having a great match. Obviously, they want to build up that show, so I think that's why they did that. However, I do think it's very weird that the main event of that ma- of uh, TLC was not brought up on Raw. They were just like, you know what, on SmackDown this week, we're going to have this these two guys fight. Oh, okay, so let's go on with Raw. Yeah, I always feel like lately they've always kind of left one match off uh, after a pay-per-view. They kind of just don't talk about one match, and they're like, yeah, we'll talk about it on SmackDown. And I don't know. I feel like uh, from what I've heard, they did a lot of that Dean and Bray build up on SmackDown recently, and I feel like that's kind of hurt the feud a little bit. Granted, they're trying to make SmackDown feel more important. But like you said, when it's the main event of a pay-per-view, it should probably get some attention on Raw. Now, we talked a lot about TLC, but last week we got a little bit of a show called NXT TakeOver 3, Our Evolution. Uh, for those that don't watch NXT, do yourself a favor. Get the network. Watch it however you need to watch NXT. It's awesome. It's got the brand new people. This guy watching me right now, he needs to watch the network. He needs to watch NXT. It's a developmental talent, but at this point, according to reports, there are way more de- than developmental talent. People backstage are apparently getting a little bit pissed because this show was off the hizzle. My nizzle. Uh, and, uh, I need that. Uh, but I want to talk about a couple of things in here. Number one, we got Kevin Owens. Okay, so for those that don't know too much about Kevin Owens, he was known as Kevin Steen all across the independent wrestling scene. An outstanding guy. You look at him physically, you don't think too much because uh, he's uh, a little bit of a heavier guy. You know, he's not a bodybuilder. But then you see this guy and just. Holy crap, he moves like a luchador. He looks. He moves like a cruiserweight. We saw him debut against poor little C.J. Parker. And we, 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 got, we gave uh, an apology to Eric Rowan. Hopefully that happens with C.J. Parker one day. What did you think, Ryan, about Kevin Owens' NXT debut? I thought he had a great debut. Uh, he just came in kind of hard-hitting. He got his nose brutally broken. And I feel like that just added to the yeah. intensity of uh, you know that he was trying to show. Because, I mean, it was essentially a jobber match. Uh, for for CJ Parker, I you know he pretty much beat him down pretty quick. But the fact that CJ Parker got that offense in to break his nose and it just it made uh, Kevin Owens just look that much more hardcore, just kind of fighting through that um, and just showing like for a big guy that he can uh, destroy you and fly around in the ring doing it. Yeah, and that whole blood. It, uh, Stone Cold once brought up in a podcast that blood does add something. And after that, the fact that that was C.J. Parker's finishing move, you know, then we see him get up and Kevin Owens is bleeding, but he's kind of like, ah, whatever, I'm going to keep wrestling. It made him a badass. Like, I think nobody, anybody that doesn't know who Kevin Owens is, they're going to be like, oh, look at this guy. I mean, they could have easily stopped the match because you see the ref trying to like sort of like help him out. But he's like, I'm not even going to, I'm going to pretend that referee doesn't exist. So, uh did you get a chance to watch uh, TakeOver, by the way, Jamie? I have not yet, but I'm going to make sure that I do soon. Yeah, please check it out. People, you got to check it out. And something else is that Finn Balor. So we had a tag team match between The Ascension, who are officially making their WWE debut after you know a lot of rumors, a lot of speculation. They got some promos that we'll probably get to in the future once we see a little bit more about that. But Finn Balor was in that match. His previous uh, indie fame involved a lot of uh, uh, face paint, just like uh, paint work. And then we got that at TakeOver. And I got to say, it was awesome. It was it sold the character a lot more because he doesn't need the face paint to get over. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's a good-looking kid. Let's be very honest. He's very much the type of uh, uh, like Randy Orton guy type thing that nobody may, may be looking for. But guess what? He can do the whole face paint thing so he can attract a whole different audience. So he's like a kind of like Jeff Hardy type thing uh what do you think about the face paint i thought it was really cool i had seen some pictures like on reddit and stuff before he debuted when i heard that he signed and saw that he liked to do like the it's almost like uh what is it like airbrush paint or something like that i don't know how he does it Uh, but i think a lot of people were unsure if that was actually going to make the jump with him to nxt so it was really cool to see that um, was he supposed to be like Carnage or something from That's Spider-Man or some sort, sort of, of tribute? Picture. Apparently, uh, somebody asked him at an NXT event or something, and the answer is there's actually a, uh, 
not like a demon, but like a monster called Baylor. So it's sort of based on that so because he chose his name based on that. So who knows? Maybe this is like uh, instead of uh, dressing up like Spider-Man or Venom, maybe this is like him. So that way they can sort of identify with that because obviously they, they can't have a WD 2K16 with him dressed up as Spider-Man. That's very true. Uh, yeah. But given that, I think the theme's really cool too that he has. I love it. I think that worked really well with his entrance and how he actually moved to like going with the theme. Uh, so I really enjoyed it, and uh, I really like this uh, this team of uh, Hideo and Baylor. I don't know if they're going to stay as a team or if this is just a one-off thing, but I think it really works, and I really like their uh, whole double drop kick to the corner gimmick and yeah. everything. So uh, I was really impressed with the entrance. NXT Championship. There are a lot of reports that Adrian Neville will apparently be called up to the roster, he just lost the championship here, so anything is possible. We got Sami Zayn, who has been trying to get that championship since day one in NXT. Talk about a storyline that they have built up. From day one, he's been like, I want to be NXT champion. Loses match after match. But once again, this shows that you don't need to win a match to become a bigger star. Then we finally get this match with two guys that they have footage and video of them, you know, knowing each other like 10 years back. So there's this whole context. We get... An amazing match. I mean, the storytelling this match is ridiculous. Then, uh, at the very end, we see Sami Zayn becomes the NXT champion. Finally, the crowd erupts. We get to the point that the, the NXT roster comes out to celebrate with him. And as of this point, I want to ask you then, uh, what was your reaction when you finally saw the 1-2-3? Uh, it was actually really cool because... Funny enough, I think the very first episode of NXT that I started to watch was the was the debut of Sami Zayn. It wasn't even on purpose or anything. So he's literally kind of been that guy that I've... From day one. That, yeah, from day one that I've followed. And I feel like he's kind of the guy that has always kind of had that journey kind of like paved out for him. And it's, it's finally after almost like two years or maybe more. Yeah, two uh, years. That, that he's finally gotten the NXT championship. So it's it, you feel like you've you've kind of grown with this guy, seen the ups and downs, um, and now to actually win the championship is really cool in, in an awesome feud with uh, Adrian Neville, who, you know, I really enjoyed how, even though he's still sort of a baby face, they made him the heel, and uh, I thought they did a really good job of making him the heel, but, like, he's not just a full-on, all of a sudden, he's a just human a, being. Yeah, he's all of a sudden not just, oh, I'm this big bad guy. It's just like, oh, well, you know, we want to cheer for Sammy, so do, he's not, he's trying to keep us from, uh, you know, diverting that attention and having it be all focused on him. And then at the end, when they were able to kind of just... Uh, you know, hug and just show mutual respect for each other. I thought that was really cool and just an awesome match. I mean, especially the thing that sticks out in my mind is uh, I forget what move eight, uh, Neville was trying to do to him, but he turned it into that power bomb. Uh, Sammy turned it into his awesome like yeah, that, power uh, bomb. Yeah, thing. That, the awesome blue, what is uh, it blue thunder power that, bomb. He yeah, does. that's it. Um, yeah, excellent, excellent match. Just a quick comment here because. NXT outstanding show from from a match standpoint, from a production standpoint, from a commentary standpoint, uh, which we can talk about in, in the future. And then we see all these reports that even like John Cena. Obviously, we're you know we are not going to confirm any of this. But I want to ask you, Ryan. Mm -hmm. You saw NXT. You saw Takeover. You saw Raw. If you were part of the WWE production team, you're not even a wrestler. You work on the Raw team. You see the NXT stuff. Do you get that that like competitive edge? Would you be like, I, I, I want to be like those guys, even though they are hypothetically, and they actually are the developmental people. You're talking like the production, like the camera crew? Like everything. Like I'm saying like the NXT seems to be its own product to the point where at first we saw like, oh, it's a good alternative product. Now it's like, a, I kind of prefer watching that overall. Yeah, I mean, we even felt you know, we felt that way even just a couple of years, I mean, a year ago even, you know. So, it's it really just has its own identity. It has its own feel. You know, I've always gone over why they can be more, uh, you know, free to do what they want. There's a lot less pressure on them. So there's a reason that they might have more tools to succeed than the millions of protocols and stuff that Monday Night Raw has to follow. So. 
because of that, NXT is able to flourish. And, you know, maybe even, I don't know how the production crew feels, because a lot of those guys who do uh, NXT are like students. You know, they're, they're, they're doing most of the camera work and everything. Hungry people, uh, man. Yeah, but I mean, it's, it's just a great thing going. And I am just waiting for the day that WWE finds a way to ruin it. But for now, let's just, <laughs> oh. let's just enjoy the, you know, the ride. Last quick comment, Jamie. As somebody that maybe doesn't regularly watch NXT, hearing what we're saying, you know, we're building up that basically you got to check this out. Do you get that uh, that enthusiasm of watching NXT maybe over uh, over Raw or something like that, just based on what you're hearing right now? Um, I can tell you from watching Raw that I have not been enjoying the past few weeks. So hearing about NXT is definitely like. I, what am I doing watching Raw when NXT is like a thousand times better? I mean, yeah, Raw has the characters I've liked for a long time, such as Kane and Goldust, who are still there. But it's like, if you remove my favorites, it's like, well, why else am I really watching Raw? That's actually a really uh, good thing. I, I want to talk to you that about that in a couple minutes. But first, you know, there's, there's, a, there's another person that should have been here. So Keith has actually done us the favor, so you're still getting this week's edition of That's Not the Right One, so but it's this one right here. <laughs> you done goof boy. That's right, baby, because if you thought episode 69 would be complete without a money shot, well guess what? You thought wrong. Yeah. This week's Tweet of the Week is brought to you by WWE Creative Humor at WWE Creative underscore ish on Twitter. If you don't follow these guys, seriously, stop what you're doing right now. Pick up your phone, go on your computer, whatever your Twitter device is, and follow these people. Kane tombstoned a bunny. And that still isn't the dumbest thing we've done all week. Thanks, Exploding Television. Tweet of the Week! Tweet of the Week! Thank you, Keith, for that beautiful Tweet of the Week. You're not here with us in person, but man, we love you and we know you're here in spirit. Remember, you can check out the podcast every single Tuesday night. We are on iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, ByteThat.com. It's all right here on the screen, too, if you're watching the YouTube version of the show. Remember, we're also getting, we also have a very special episode next week where we talk about the best and maybe some of the worst in WWE in 2014. And right now, you know that in the past month or so, we've been promoting a giveaway courtesy of Gemso's Beat Sprites. Uh, thanks to Gene the Man for participating. You won. It's on the way. I look forward to seeing where you guys uh, put that in your room, Gene the Man. But... Uh, Jamie, I actually want to give you a little bit of a time to tell us what Gemso's all about and how can they find more information about it. Well, first, thanks to everyone who participated in the WrestleMania Beat Sprite. It did take me quite a bit of time to make, so thank you for everyone who entered into the Beat Sprite giveaway. Gemzo's is all about Beat Sprites, all your favorite collectibles that you could possibly imagine here. If you are watching the YouTube version, you see here Zack Ryder, who's no longer relevant, but here's a Beat Sprite of Zack Ryder. <laughs> <laughs> so for people who still like Zack Ryder, there is a Zack Ryder Beat Sprite available on my shop, www.etsy.com slash shop slash Gemzos. I believe I have that right. I apologize if I do not. But if you just simply look up Gemzos, J-E-M-Z-O-S, on Etsy, you will find my shop. It has all the collectibles you could possibly imagine with Super Mario Brothers, Dragon Ball Z, Pokemon, Wrestling, Bang a man, anything you could Kane. imagine is there. And Kane, the big red machine, is there for sale. So we got all that stuff, man. It's awesome. You really got to check it out. This is a uh, part of my decoration back when uh, I uh, loved me some Zack Ryder. But it's, when he it's was awesome. relevant. Like, put it this way. Even if you don't like the guy, it's still awesome. You, so you really got to do yourself a favor. You go to uh, Facebook.com slash Gemzos also. I got I to gotta ask you something. Before uh, the Tweet of the Week, You've been saying that, you know, you haven't been enjoying the product as of late. You know, Ryan, Keith, and myself, we always talk about that, but it's the three of us that we've been doing a podcast for over a year. So it's kind of nice to hear somebody else talk about the same thing. So I'm giving you about a minute here. Tell us, what aren't you enjoying about the product? I mean, I watch it with my little sister at times, and even she's like, well, what the hell's going on here? I mean, 
and she's 14, mind, going on 14, and she's even like, this is stupid, this is dumb, and this is a teenager over here that's making these comments. And when she's making those comments, it makes me feel like, well, what the hell am I watching this then if a teenager is feeling this way? And even my little brother cannot get into it at times because he just doesn't care about the characters that they have. I feel like one of the things they're really missing is like distinct characters. That That's something that got me being a fan of the product to begin with. I mean, when I started watching, what really grabbed me was Kane and The Undertaker. I love their gimmicks. I love the whole dark mask, the whole shebang that they had going on there. Yeah, it's interesting because sometimes you talk about wrestling being too serious and all that stuff, but your favorite characters are Kane, Goldust, you know, guys with face paint and all that stuff. And wrestling, it, it kind of needs that. You know, it's not like a, an immature thing. It's not a face. Realistically, it's it's kind of nice. So uh, what do you think about that, Ryan? We actually get like an, yet another opinion about a similar thing we've talked about. No, I, I definitely hear what Jamie's saying. I think it just justifies how right we are on a week-to-week basis talking about how they lack characters. <laughs> but in all seriousness, I actually want to ask you, Jamie, because... You know, we do talk about how they need more characters, more people who are outside of sort of the norm. Is Bray Wyatt... Yes. Some, yes. <laughs> you knew exactly where I was <laughs> that going. That was quick. It. So Bray Wyatt's more like something where they're doing something right, yes. definitely. And how do you feel about Dean Ambrose? Do you feel like they're uh, they're going in the right direction with him too? Um, I do like Ambrose, but if you really look at Ambrose's main events, he hasn't... If you look at it, he hasn't won the main events in the past few months, which might start to hurt after a while. He'll have that, uh, I guess I call it the Ryback effect, where you just keep losing every big match. Saying, but strictly, strictly from a character standpoint, do you feel like he's, maybe he's not on par with Bray Wyatt, but do you feel like he's someone who's kind of on the right track of being outside of the norm? Yeah, because he has that whole crazy psycho thing going, which is different than what they usually have on TV. So, yeah, I do like him. It's it's awesome to really hear about this because Jamie, even though he's a friend, he doesn't watch the he doesn't listen to the podcast every week. Two jobs, man. Yeah, I mean, there's it's difficult, but you can make up time for it. But uh, <laughs> the point is that all these things we talk about on a weekly basis. Here's somebody that you know you're not contaminated with like things that we've said. It's like oh, I'm we're, I'm on bite that or something. I'll, I'll say what they agree with. You know, you got your your teenage sister, you got your baby brother, and you got yourself. Three completely different age groups. That's technically who WWE is trying to appeal to. And even they are sort of saying like, yeah, this is not really for And even they also notice how like the storylines make no sense. Like my sister was watching it and she doesn't watch all the time. And she was like, why is Brie Bella with Nikki again? When she last watched it, they were actually doing that whole assistant deal. And now all of a sudden they're together again. We got to talk about that then because... That's given us a tremendous headache because we had the whole CM Punk podcast, Vince McMahon stuff. We didn't have too much time to talk about it. So getting to the Brie Bella thing, what the hell? Because uh, we've been sort of saying, oh, they're doing a similar thing with like AJ Lee and uh, Dina Bryant. At some point, she's going to explode or, or whatever the hell. But they are just, you know, referencing the fact that, yeah, they, they made up and now they're sisters. And now she's supporting the, the Nikki Bella, who's the champion. So how how do you feel when they've invested months in us for this storyline and now they are at point B? It really kind of just throws the whole summer away with their whole feud because you felt like when Brie Bella had to become the personal assistant for 30 days that, you know, Nikki was going to keep torturing her and eventually Brie would lash out and then they'd have some big match to, to finish off the feud. But then it just randomly became that, you know, she she helps Nikki win the championship. And then all of a sudden, the next night on Raw, it's like, oh, yeah, you know, we're cool, whatever. No uh, and it doesn't make sense. I feel like they locked themselves into a corner with the 30-day, uh, like, the 30-day, uh, what is it called, assistant thing or whatever. Yeah. Like, being a butler. I don't know what you want to call they it. And the personal up. assistant. Um, because they should have just said indefinitely. You know, that way they could keep it going until they were ready for the feud. But now I just feel like they turned Brie Bella heel just to be on TV with Nikki because they have nothing else for her to do. It's not like Brie can just go off and do her own feud because they only have so much TV time. You know, they're doing other things. So they basically just kind of had her tag along just, just to keep her on TV and keep her relevant when 
they just have absolutely nothing to do with her right now. Um, I think maybe Total Divas might be a reason as to why, because they are usually together from what I hear and see. I don't usually watch Total Divas, but I mean, the two of them are usually linked, so to have them hate each other in TV might be a reason why. Yeah, it's true, because one thing is to have characters that hate each other, but the whole thing is their sister, so it's really difficult, like... Hey, I'm I'm gonna go hate you then, you know, and you do total diva say, like, Hey, oh that was awesome how you told me to like screw off or something. <laughs> so now it's it's just sort of difficult, but it's upsetting because once again, inconsistency with storylines and not just us are watching, like not just the majority, like the twenty year plus, we even got kids Teenagers. like pointing that out. Like, yeah, that that just does not make sense. Now, something else we've been complaining about is the WWE champion. He won the championship. Then he was almost never there again. And even though we, we were sort of like, yeah, that's going to happen, we, were thought, we thought his presence was going to be felt a little bit more than it has. Then we get to Raw. We get a segment with Jericho. He F5s uh, Chris Jericho. We were paranoid that maybe is, is that his only appearance tonight? Are you kidding me? Be but pleased. yeah, they actually had him at the main event match, which is uh, the uh, Steel Cage match. Then we got the whole thing with Seth Rollins and all that. But we got the champion. Part one, no championship. Part two, <laughs> then it's there. He, you know, he kind of holds it. Then Paul he, Heyman he grabs it. He finally remembered he has a title. Yeah, I think he like forgot about it. So does that sort of help with the whole situation that we've having? We've been having with Brock's absence, or is it just like yeah, you're trying to fix something that's already broken? Well, I mean, it's always nice to actually have the champion on TV. So I was glad to see Brock back. But I really did surprise me and kind of throw me that he didn't initially come out with the belt. Because, I mean, at this point, we we hardly see that belt anymore. And it, it feels like at least every time he shows up, he needs to remind us that he's champion. But he didn't even feel like the champion when he was out there the first time. Um, so, I, you know, I don't know if that was just a mistake or whatever. I mean, it was very clear he came out the second time with the belt. You know, I don't know if... Uh, Vince, you know, corrected him backstage or whatever. It was pissed that he didn't Damn initially. It, yeah, he initially he didn't come out with it. But um, yeah, I don't know. It was it was good that he uh, he finally did come out with it. But you know, we need every time we see Brock, we got to see that belt because it happens so few and far between. I have a theory that I want to uh, get to your guys' opinion on. I don't agree with it already. I'm, I'm just going to stay with that right <laughs> off the bat. But that what if the WWE hat didn't have him come up with the championship just so he focused on Brock Lesnar, not like, oh, the champion's back, and just like that whole surprise factor. And now that we know he was there, his presence is there, then we see him come up with the championship. I pretty much think that, think that is what they did, even though I don't agree with it. But what, what do you think? Is that a possibility that WWE did that? Um, it for some reason it wouldn't surprise me, and that could be a possible thing that they did. But he should have came out with the belt to begin with, and when he came out to attack Jericho, where was Cena? I mean, if Cena is trying to go after Lesnar, he was right there. Cena could have easily just ran down, had a small little brawl with Lesnar, sent him packing, maybe tried to help Jericho a bit. I mean, Jericho did give him the match with Rollins for the night that wouldn't have happened if he wasn't there. That's a really good observation. Yeah. The answer to that is <laughs> that it's not good storytelling or whatever because they will break character logic for storytelling or at least for moments because you know they wanted to end the show with the Cena Brock stare down. That it sure it made more sense for Cena to be you know the heroic good guy that he always is to come down save Jericho. He knows he's facing Lesnar at Royal Rumble, so he wants to get involved. But because they want to save that moment for the end of the show, Jericho kind of gets screwed over. I'm thinking too logically with wrestling. I'm exactly. Sorry. We always say, don't apply logic to yeah, wrestling. Yeah, don't apply it's logic to wrestling. It's hard when I'm an accountant. You always, <laughs> gotta, you always just got to think, you know, why do they do it? It's because they want to make certain moments happen for the show, and they, they have to, you know, squiggle away to connect the dots to get to that point, even if it means you know, breaking certain logic here and there. You mean all the time. Which, you know, coincidentally enough or funny enough makes usually for terrible movies. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we're talking about the world of wrestling, man. So, yeah, we, we can't apply too much logic to that thing. Unfortunately. And uh, we brought this guy up already. 
But I got to mention the fact that, yes, Roman Reigns is back. He's going to be in action in this week's edition of SmackDown. So obviously getting more viewers, more people sitting there. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of Roman Reigns. I've been saying it since day one of the podcast. I think him and Dean O'Brien, I'll be a little bit controversial, that uh, they both are guys that WWE want to get over, but don't give them a microphone. Just, just let them do their thing, but don't let them talk. It doesn't sound natural. It sounds really fake, really forced, really fed. And uh, he's believe there. That. And pretty much, yeah, I like, believe that. It, <laughs> it feels so forced. It, like, just this random catchphrase that doesn't work for him. Uh, what are your expectations on the road to WrestleMania, which we're pretty much starting now, knowing that his first roadblock is the big show, and there's the Royal Rumble at some point. We may even see that match there, but obviously... We're, we got to start speculating soon who's going to win the Rumble and how. What about Roman Reigns taking on the Big Show as part one of that thing? I can't say I'm really too excited for it. Um, the whole thing with Roman Reigns on the mic, you know, we kind of said some similar things about Seth Rollins a little while ago, and then he's improved drastically. So, you know, I'll never be against a guy who wants to improve himself, and he seems like... He's getting a little bit better. I can't really get excited for this Big Show match, yeah. though. Reigns has really yet to prove himself in one-on-one matches. I think he still kind of needs to be carried. Um, nevertheless, uh, he obviously was the first person to declare. How did he say it? Declare? Or, yeah, the, the, uh, he's like, he said some weird word. We're just like, just oh, what's going that. on? Yeah, he had a he really awful promo at the pay-per-view. And he did that De Niro face or whatever people are calling it. Yeah, yeah. But either way, I mean, I feel like he's a heavy favorite to win the Rumble this year. I think he's going to win. And and if he does, I almost feel like, uh, I think it's in Philadelphia maybe. But I feel like we might be in for uh, another uh, Batista moment from last year. Oh, boy. So, I don't know. Let's see how it goes. But... I don't see how you can really get hyped up for a one-on-one match with the Big Show, especially when it's a guy like Roman Reigns, who's you know it's not going to be this quick, you know, match and just a lot of rest holds. I feel like are coming down the pike for that one. <laughs> Do you think it's a good step one for Roman Reigns, Big Show? Um, the match is nothing exciting to look forward to. I mean, Big Show, Roman Reigns. Maybe I could I see that's why Big Show beat Eric Rowan, but um, I'm not at all looking forward to Big Show Roman Reigns. It does not appeal to me one bit. And I, I mean, when I think of the match, I just don't I don't care. Hey, you're, you're entitled to your opinion. We, you know, it's cool, man. It's cool. Uh, but uh, part two, then you mentioned that Roman Reigns is probably going to win. Yes. Is that your pick or is that what you think is going to happen? Um, after last year's Royal Rumble, I honestly did believe that they were going to make him the guy to win last, uh, this year's Rumble. He's not going to win last year's Rumble. (laughs) Do you want that though? I can't say I do. And to be honest, I wouldn't know who to pick as the winner yet, who I'd want to see win. Do you think it's good that we sort of have that unpredictability because... I'm trying really hard to think, and like, Seth Rollins is still the Mr. Money in the Bank. Brock Lesnar is the champion. Uh, so we got to think, like, is is it going to be Cena? You know, Please, uh, please no. Yeah, but, <laughs> but it's a, a likely scenario. We may get Brock Cena like five or four or five. Well, they're in the t- that's they a title was- match. So they generally, whoever's in the title match is not in the Rumble. So we might be safe. From John Cena being in the Rumble match. Never say never. But it's usually... Number 30, man. It's usually who is most obvious, I feel like, at least the past few years. It seemed obvious that it was going to be Cena that was going to win two years ago. He won. Uh, it seemed pretty obvious that either Batista. Batista or Daniel Bryan, if he was in it, was going to win. So, obviously, given the fact that Bryan wasn't in it, we all pretty much expected Batista, and that happened. So, right now, at least... Uh, with uh, what do we got like five or six weeks till the rumble yeah. right now it's definitely looking like it's going to be rains uh unfortunately i mean i <laughs> i really don't feel like i mean especially with this in uh, like uh injury that he's really had enough time to develop to be that wrestlemania main event um so i i think they're really kind of getting him in over his head right now i feel like he needs at least another whole year uh just to be kind of ready for that spot assuming he improves you know, in that year. 
they try they tried to make Ryback work like in every way possible, and it just didn't work that first time. Then you turn him heel, it didn't work. It's like take time with Roman Reigns because I think they do really have something in there. Like the same with Rocky Maivia, probably nobody expected that guy to become the Rock. He didn't become the Rock overnight. They had him in the Nation of Domination. Uh, Roman, Re- Roman Reigns had the thing where it, they already started off in a stable, so that's good and bad. But now just take your time. Because if he fails right now at WrestleMania, if people don't inter- don't uh, sort of react to him the I way they expect, they got, which kind of like maybe like the New Day, which I think that they're like a babyface team, but they're not necessarily getting the reaction that WWE expects him to get. Yeah, that, that, I don't think that helps with the whole situation of like, oh, NXT competing with Raw, then the CM Punk signing with UFC. You got eyeballs so much on the product right now, you really got to cherry pick those things that you want to be exposed. So... Uh, Jamie, I actually want to thank you for being on the show, man. It's been awesome, no bro. Uh, we will see you this Saturday in my wedding, my friend. Yes. Uh, and uh, thank you for everybody that's been watching. Remember, next week we got the best of 2014 and a little bit of everything else that Ryan is going to get to as we people close out the show. All right. Well, we want to thank everyone for uh, tuning in. And if you watched on the YouTube video, thanks for watching our first video edition. We will have one more video edition, as Juan said, next week where we're doing our version of the year-end awards, the Biteys. As always, check out our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash Bite That Cast. Hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. You can check out our social media. Twitter is at Bite That Cast. Tweet us a question for the show. As well as, uh, you can always email us a question as well, bitethatcast at gmail.com. And you can check out our Facebook, facebook.com forward slash bitethatcast. So we look forward to one more video edition of the podcast next week. Thanks again for listening and or watching, and we'll see you next time. Peace. Bye-bye.